All right, here we go. How does it sound? Sounds good, looks good. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. I'm Carrie Roberts, uh, or one equals one on Twitter. We also have with me here in the house, Darren Roberts, my husband. He's Mr. Or one equals one. I helped him with that idea. <laughs> and we also have Cameron, Junior or one equals one. And here we're sporting our nerd glasses. And to introduce ourselves, we even have some little junior hackers in the house that we're training up back here that help us out. Uh, we're kind of a family of hackers and it's fun. This is our first presentation as a family at anything. And this is a presentation on the domain password audit tool. Watch how the kids help out when, when we're taking drinks of our sodas here. <laughs> okay, so we're presenting on the domain password audit tool, which is a tool I wrote originally. But since then, Darren and Cameron have maintained and added features too as part of their uh, mentoring into InfoSec. And we're gonna start off this presentation with a little cheerleading episode about getting into InfoSec presented by me. And then I'll turn it over to Cameron who will give us some history on uh, how passwords work, how to crack password hashes, how, hash were, how hashes are obtained from computers, et cetera. So bear with me while I do the little cheerleading section here and the introduction. So I started out as a mechanical engineer working for HP building automation equipment. It was awesome, but there came a time I worried about job security at the company. So I went back to school and learned computering. And I came back in 2007 again to HP and started programming, writing PC applications and mobile applications, ultimately became a web application developer. That was super fun. Uh, I got to develop a brand new web app and I was the main developer and I was a new web app developer really. And one day uh, while I was happily developing about to release our web app, my boss walked by with a notepad of paper, dropped it on my desk, it was a report and he pointed at the report and he said fix this stuff and I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, I just saw a lot of red on the paper so I started reading and I realized that management had had a uh, uh, security tests done on my application before we released it and it turns out it was vulnerable to some big security vulnerabilities. Uh, one of the main vulnerabilities was SQL injection where the report said we could read, modify, or delete any data that you have and store in your database and all we have to do is type in something like or one equals one into one of your input fields. And I was like, no way, this can't be. I was like in shock and disbelief. So I go to my develop machine and I type in their example payload and you know the database, my development database goes away. And so I'm just completely in shock. Um, also learned about cross-site scripting, which I'd never heard of before. And that my app was vulnerable to that in a lot of places as well. So that was my, introduction to information security. So I went home that night very discouraged, like, oh my goodness, I've just been destroyed. My application's terrible. Uh, I didn't know, even know this was possible and kind of shrugged my shoulders and pouted my way home, talked to my husband and, and told my husband, uh, I just can't be a, a good de developer or programmer if I don't know anything about security. But he encouraged me to go ahead and just embrace security instead of kind of like be scared of it and worried that I didn't know anything to embrace it and learn about it. So I inquired around with coworkers what would be a good way for me to learn about security. And in 2010, I took my first security class from SANS and I became certified at, in information security fundamentals. So I took their 301 class. It was a really good class. I enjoyed it. I took a few more classes over the next year and that's where I learned about pen testing. So it hadn't really occurred to me that uh, this pen testing, you know, trying to break into applications or computer systems and make them not make them do things they weren't supposed to do or steal information would be a really fun job. So um, when I learned about that, uh, I realized that I really wanted to be a pen tester. This would be a really cool job instead of trying to make things work, try to make them break and try to break in and steal things. And even sometimes physically get permission to physically break in and learn to pick locks and jump through windows. So I thought this, 
this is definitely the job for me. So I, it became my goal to become a pen tester. It reminded me of that sneakers movie uh, where uh, ex uh, convicts kind of they get together and prove that they can steal money from a bank, but it wasn't all an approved activity. So when they're done with that job and the lady's typing out the check, she's asking them, so people hire you to break into their places to make sure no one can break into their places. And, and that's exactly what it is. And he replies, it's a living. And so I like that movie. Uh, so in 2014, I reached my goal and I became, I finished my, I went for the master's degree in information security from CNS and completed that and became a, a penetration tester for Black Hills Information Security. I love that, but I moved on in 2017 to the Walmart Red Team and did that for a couple years. And then I moved to the blue team, which is the net network defender. So instead of breaking in, it's back to keeping people from breaking in. And I did that really with the goal to become a better red teamer. Not necessarily that I will go back to red team, but I wanted to understand both sides and everything about everything because I like to learn a lot. It's one of my main goals. So I'm over on blue team now. So, I was having so much fun at this time Darren was a high school math teacher online and he saw me and I'm just having so much fun in my room like look at this I'm breaking into this and doing this and I'm making good money um, compared to a teacher especially <laughs> sorry to say and um, and I had a flexible schedule where I work from so, home so it was great and Darren started saying I wish I could be a pen tester and I'd say I'd put on my cheerleading outfit yeah yeah do it do it you should do it totally do it and he'd be he'd say no I'm too old you know he he was 40 something 40 early 40s and he's like ah oh, it's probably too late for me I can't do it so we wouldn't talk about it for a while and then he would again he would see me having way too much fun making good money and having a flexible schedule and he would say again I should uh I, I wish I could be a pen tester. I should be a pen tester. And I would cheer for him. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he would say he was too old. And then ultimately he agreed and he went back to school and got a bachelor's in computer information technology. He would, went to school online and finished that. And while he was doing that, he also went and got certified uh, after taking some SANS classes. So we got three certifications in those topics listed there. And in 2017, he became a pen tester for Black Hills. And, and then as a recent contributor to the domain password audit tool, which we are talking about today. And lastly, we have Cameron. He's my son, he's 17. Uh, I put him on summer coding programs to keep him from playing his computer too much, which annoys me. And so he's gotten really good at Python. He's also taking some high school programming classes and he's been contributing to DPAP by fixing bugs and adding features. So if you end up going and looking at our code, you'll see the features he's added there. And with that, <clears throat> so the moral of this little cheerleading story is that you're never too old. You can get into InfoSec and be rewarded if you're old or young, male or free, wise or otherwise, <clears throat> you can do it. So with that, uh, you, you just need to be willing to take that first step and, and then you take one more and one more and eventually you're going to get there. So I'm going to turn this over to Cameron who will um, give us some background on passwords and how they're stored and how attackers steal them and how they try to crack them to get your original password back. So I'm Cameron Roberts at Junior or one equals one. So I'm going to be talking about passwords and password hashes. So computers will normally store the hash of your password instead of like the actual text of your password. So they'll take the text and then put it through this hashing algorithm and then they'll output this long random string of numbers and letters. So the hashing algorithm encodes data into a small fixed size and will always give the same hash for the same password. And it doesn't really matter how long the password is or how short the password is, it'll always be this same length. Um, hashing algorithms are one way, meaning that you can't take the hash and 
reverse engineer the algorithm to get the password back. And you can only put them in and get the hash out. So password cracking is where you have this hash that you don't know the password for. So you would guess a password such as password one and put it into the algorithm and get the hash. So that in this case, the hash is not the correct hash. So you would guess a different password such as password two and put that in and it's still the wrong one. And then you'd guess password three and then that's suddenly the right password. So now you know password three is the password for the hash. Um, Windows stores two different types of password hashes. There's land manager and new technology LM hashes. And um, the LM hash is older and is where they split the password into two sections of up to seven characters each. And they take each section and convert through put it through that hashing algorithm, then put the two hashes together to make this one longer hash. And they convert the password into uppercase letters so there's so that there's less options on the different hashes that you can have. So in this example, there's bada bing baby where only certain letters are capitalized and it's the same hash as the bada bing baby where more letters are capitalized and where all the letters are capitalized. Um, so the LM hash is pretty weak because the time to crack a seven letter password is the same to crack an eight letter password, which is the same to crack a 14 letter password. Um, so an LM hash can only have uppercase letters, numbers, and special characters, which, and it splits it in half. So there's only up to like a basically seven letter password. So that gives a total of one trillion different combinations, which is a relatively small amount for how fast computers are today. And a, a NTLM hash can have uppercase letters, lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters and it doesn't split it in half. So you, like however long you put in your password, there's actually that many letters that it uses. So all of that makes it so that there's one octillion different combinations of hashes, which is way more secure. Um, on my computer, it would take an average of about eight minutes to crack any given 14 character password hash while it would take 4.3 billion years to crack any 14 character password NTLM hash. So how does the bad guy get your hash is a pretty big question because if they don't have your hash, they can't crack the hash. Um, so they can get access to your computer by like a phishing email or some other form of hacking and, or they can get access to a different computer that would store your hash, such as a domain controller on an enterprise environment. So an enterprise environment is where there's the computers on the domain that have all their own stuff. And then they all connect to this domain controller that stores their hashes and all their inf other information to authenticate the users that are using the computer. So, the domain controller would store, in this example, it would store Larry's hash, Curly's hash, and Moe's hash. But on more recent versions of Windows, the, the machine will not store the LM hash because it's so weak and replace it with this AAD hash, which is the hash for a blank password. So access to the main domain controller is really not good for any hacker because of all the information that it has on hashes and all the users on the domain. So I'm gonna turn it over to Darren now. Hello everybody, this is uh, Darren Roberts and um, I'm Mr. Or one equals one. I am going to be talking about the domain password audit tool, but I wanna point out some, a few things about what Cameron said. Um, 
the one of the things that we <clears throat> do at my work, I work for Black Hills Information Security. Um, we recommend passwords of 15 characters or more. Um, the reason why we do that is specifically for that LM hash. It's uh, amazing how many times you're on a test and you get access to the um, you get access to the hashes and you crack them and you do find out that there are LM hashes on the environment, even though people, um, as you talk to the people, they swear up and down that there aren't LM hashes. Um, you still find them out there. So uh, with the 15 character password, it does break that um, poss the possibility of even storing the LM hash. So there are older um, older systems out there that do re uh, save LM hashes. So uh, we encourage you to have your passwords of 15 characters or more. But anyway, onto the domain password audit tool. So uh, what you can get it here at the at the repo CLR208 um, DPAT. Uh, there is a great readme that explains all that you need to know about it. Um, it has a lot of inf great information and explains um, what it is and how to use it. But we're going to go through and uh, look at it. So one of the things that you need are the um, hashes from the domain controller. And again, Cameron explained what that is. But you, there's a command to get the, do the hashes off of the domain controller. And you can see here, it's also in the readme. But what this is going to do is it gonna, it's going to dump the hashes into a file that's called an mtds.dit file. And this file is not very uh, readable in terms of humans or, um, and so we need actually need to change this file. The way that we do that is use secrets dump. And again, this command, you can see it, it's on the, um, DPAT repo. But what the secret stump does is it's going to take that ntds.dit file and it's going to convert it into this more usable format. And we're going to get three, four, four, three files out. One is the customer.ntds file. And uh, you can name that whatever it is, which, whatever you want. But this ntds file is going to have the, um, the username and it's going to have the lm hash as well as the ntlm hash. And as you're looking through this, hopefully um, if you do this on your own environment, you will see all blank lm hashes. Because if you don't have blank lm hashes, then those uh, hashes will be cracked um, when you send them through a cracker. The other thing that you can notice on this is there's a history for each of these users. Um, the way that you get that is you add this um, uh, flag at the end dash history. And this history is going to output um, all of the history, password history stored for the users. So you can see we have user Harry um, and then the previous password, the last password that he used is going to be stored as the history zero and, and so on and so forth that goes back through the history of the passwords that he's used. By default, Active Directory is going to store 24 of these, um, 24 of the passwords. And you can adjust that, you can change it if you want, uh, but by default, it's set to 24. Uh, this, is, this has some great information, not only for um, domain, domain admins to look through. Also for hackers, it's kind of uh, gives a lot of information for uh, what we can use. But after you get this NTDS file, you, need, you then will need to send it through some kind of a cracker. Uh, Hashcat and John the Ripper are very popular ones. Uh, but you can send this through the cracker and then try to crack all of the passwords. And again, depending on the length of the password will depend on um, how easy it's cracked. The, another thing that is important, oh, I don't know, I know how I just got there. Sorry. 
But one of the things that uh, you need to look at is the word list. So the more complete your word list, the more complete uh, your cracking will be. You can see some of these passwords that got cracked on the side over here. Of course, this was just an example and we could put in whatever we want into the word list. Some of these probably would not be cracked um, by a regular cracking machine, but if you put them in a word list, then for sure they will be cracked. So even though you have a long password, you need to make sure that the long password is something that is not in any word list. Um, otherwise, it'll probably be cracked rather quickly. So again, after we have the output from our uh, cracking machine, um, Hashcat saves this as a, a .pot, a .pot file. So we then are going to go to our dpat tool. So after we have the dpat tool, um, again, you can see uh, the, this is what the repo looks like. You can see um, how to clone it. So you just would clone that into uh, your machine and then run the file. Um, so running the file is gonna look something like this. With this file, um, we're giving it our customer.ntds file, we're giving it our pot file, and then we're also giving it some of our admins information because this, again, this is just gonna let us look at some of the groups that maybe we wanna um, look at to see how their passwords fared. So you can actually give it group files and, um, and look at specific users and how their passwords were. And another thing that it's the tool is going to do um, is try and crack the NT hashes based on the LM hash. So we know that LM hashes, uh, when you send it through Hashcat or whatever, LM hashes are going to be cracked. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have the NT password. So what this DPAT tool does is it's going to compare these hashes and it's going to try to finish cracking them based on our the output for the LM hash. Like Cameron said, the LM hash is all uppercase. So the LM hash is going to be all uppercase. That is probably not the way that a user would store their password. So the DPAT tool is going to look at the LM hash, look at analyze all of the uppercase letters and then go through lower casing or whatever to, to these cracked LM hashes to see if you, they can get the cracked NT hash. After we go through that, we are going to then open the report and it's going to look like this. So again, um, we get great output from this. Uh, if we click on the details for the password hash, we get this output and we see the username, the password, the password length, and the NT hash. So, uh, and then again, if it's, if the LM password has been cracked. Now, again, look at these things, some of these passwords that were cracked. Um, I doubt that this one up here, this top one was really cracked, um, but unless, except if, it was in the word list. So if it was in the word list that it was used, obviously it would be cracked. I don't think that a password length of 39 would be cracked if it wasn't in the word list. So again, training users on not using common passwords if they're in the word list, make sure that that's the case. So again, you can look through these um, passwords and uh, check how secure your passwords are in your environment. Uh, when we do this for customers on tests, this is, uh, they really like seeing this kind of information. Uh, it does give them insight as to what's going on with the users, how they're storing passwords, how they're choosing passwords, gives uh, the administrators more leverage as to training, maybe creating a pa stronger password policy uh, so this is something that everybody can use. Uh, we, uh, again, when we crack passwords and run it through this, this is something that uh, our customers at Black Hills really like to see. They love to see this kind of information. 
Um, so the, this is a list of the passwords that were cracked via the LM hash. Um, again, these are not necessarily weak passwords, but uh, because they were stored as an LM hash, they were able to be cracked very easily. And you would want to look through this again as an administrator, uh, find out why these are stored in LM hashes. Um, if it's a, if there is some kind of a tool on your network, a system on your network that requires the LM hash, look to upgrade that so that you can get rid of these LM hashes some way. But um, LM hashes basically shouldn't be there. It's, they're still found on environments. It's not, it's really not uncommon for us to see them. And, uh, but if you can get rid of them, it's obviously the best thing. You can, uh, we also have an output of password link statistics. So again, this is only based on the passwords that were cracked. Um, if a password is not cracked, there's essentially no way to know exactly how long the password was. But out of the ones that are cracked, you can see the details on how, um, on how long the passwords are. Again, this gives you great detail as far as uh, an administrator so that you can, again, offer more training and more opportunity to help your um, employees and uh, coworkers to improve their password policy. We can look at the password reuse stats. This is great information here. Um, for example, let's say you find a, a password of welcome one, two, three that is just all throughout your environment. This could be your IT support people giving out a password to set up a new account or to reset a password. And then the people just never changing their password after that happens. So you can look through common password reuses to find out information patterns that are going on with users in your network. Um, we, uh, as when we try to crack passwords or guess passwords, the season in here is a very common, uh, it's a very common password. And you'll probably see that all throughout your network, depending on your password policy. So again, look through password re reuse stats. It helps um, with help, helping training. Now, if you try and get that password history, this is going to, uh, you might get this uh, output. So what this is saying is when you ran the secret stump.py, you didn't use that flag of history that I talked about. So you'd need to go back, run the secret stump.py with that flag of history, and then again, try to crack those passwords if you do that, you'll get an output like this that talks about, um, and then you can see here we have the list of the, the users and their current password and all of the previous passwords. So you might again see some significant patterns that might help you again train users. So as most of you know, when you're required to get a new password, you can't use either one of the similar last five passwords that you use or whatever it is. So users will typically just change one character, maybe a number, maybe the season and the number. So you can look through this and see um, patterns. For example, Mo, um, we see that he's using signs of the zodiac. So we might be able to guess actually what this password is for history one. We can even probably guess his current password because we know his previous passwords. So that's one way that this password history can be used. Um, and for uh, hackers, we like to see as many passwords as we can because it gives us great information on what is common and what we should guess next. So um, that's pretty much what we have. Hopefully that was useful. Um, if you are if you do have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from them. You can hit us up on Twitter or whatever. And um, anyway, thank you.